everyone. Welcome to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. We're honored to be coming to you live, courtesy of our broadcasting partner, moretalk.tv. Today on Reflections, joining us is Darren Owens. Darren Owens is a psychic and supernaturalist and is the best-selling author of Reader of Hearts, The Life and Teachings of a Reluctant Psychic. He has also authored Becoming Masters of Light, Co-Creating the New Age of Enlightenment, a personal favorite book of mine. And for more than 18 years, Darren has brought authentic enlightenment to countless souls through a powerful psychic gift that he has carried with him since birth. Since 1995, he has maintained a highly successful consultation practice, providing accurate readings to clients on an international scale. More than 20 years of expertise in the fields of the supernatural, spiritual healing, and mysticism has ordained Darren with the honor of being a well-respected specialist in his profession. If you want to learn more about Darren Owens, you can check out his website at darrenowensofficial.com. That's D-A-R-R-I-N, owensofficial.com. Darren Owens, thank you so much for joining us back on Reflections. Well, thank you for having me. I really love doing the show. Absolutely. We're honored to have you on again. And I know that um, you have a book out that should be coming out here in the next few weeks. It's uh, entitled Mysteries of the Supernatural. And uh, the thing I love about this book is it seems to cover a large variety of topics, which to me as a reader really makes it very appealing. Um, you had mentioned that it's, um, this has kind of been a dream of yours to write this book. How did the writing of this book come about? Well, I, for several years, people have been wanting me to write about my experiences with the supernatural. There's a lot of uh, stories that I haven't really written about or been public about in my work as a psychic and a paranormal researcher, but mainly the catalyst was sort of watching the reality show phenomena dealing with the paranormal. And there, like I've said, there's so much BS being sort of put out there on television, I just I had enough. I had to write a book about a more grounded perspective when you're dealing with the supernatural. So that was the biggest catalyst for this book. Great. And in the uh, first chapter of your book, you, you kind of talk about a spiritual crossroads, and uh, you talk a lot about yeah. the veil, which is such an interesting topic. Um, why do you think there's always been so much fascination built up about this idea of the the unseen realms, um, even to the point now where science is, is really starting to explore what we would call the supernatural? Well, I, I think it's inherent in us to have an interest in what's beyond the veil, what's at, what goes on after death, what's, what's behind the curtain, so to say, because we're, we have been through the veil. When we incarnate on this planet, we merge through the veil ourselves, so it's almost like a remembrance. So I always put that connection with our interest in the supernatural to actually a remembrance of the supernatural, because we are supernatural beings. We just happen to be in a physical body right now, but we still have memories, and we still have connections to what's beyond this physical realm. So right. it's just inherent in us to be fascinated by the supernatural part right. of who we are. And one thing I really liked about you was that you, you're known to openly discuss, um, I guess, what many would call the darker side of the supernatural world, which to me to hear you discuss it and write about it is, is actually truly refreshing because some people avoid it and they put such a negative spin on it. And, you know, living in a pol polarized world is that you have, you know, you can't have dark without light. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in this field and kind of why you feel it's important to the readers of your book to, to know about you know, what, what's the truth behind the, the darker side? Well, just, just like in real life, we have nice people in our lives, and then we have people that aren't so nice. And it's the same exact reflection that goes on in the supernatural. You have spirits that are in league with love, and then you have spirits that are the complete opposite of that. So, yeah, you've got to have the dark, you've got to have the light, and it's a balance. But... For whatever reason, my very first experience as a baby psychic years and years ago, even before I wrote my first book, was dealing with the subject of exorcism and spirit attachment. And while other people were learning to read tarot cards and read auras and stuff, I was learning how to perform spiritual deliverances and exorcisms. So it's pretty hilarious 
that at 21 I was being educated in this type of stuff. So from the very beginning, discernment and learning to discern the spirits was key for me because that would later on be the main focus of my work is releasing fear and embracing love. That's how I simplify it because you don't want to scare people because the minute you say exorcism or, you know, releasing demonic spirits and that type of thing, you immediately think of The Exorcist, the movie, and, you know, people throw right. up pea soup. So the reality <laughs> of it is, is, yeah, the reality of the kind of work I do, the spiritual deliverance work, is a magnified process of releasing fear and letting the soul, the person that I'm working on, embrace love. So you're really rebalancing people's energy, you're releasing negative energies, and you're embracing the light that we all are you're getting back. It's right. almost like hitting the reset button. But right. unfortunately, there are spirits, there are energies out there that do not have your best interest. And I, being from Arkansas, I, I always say it's like walking through the woods. You're going to get ticks on your ankles if you don't have any uh, you know, socks or any kind of bug spray. So it's the same thing in the spiritual world. If you don't have your own spiritual protection or a strong ideal that you're standing on, you will pick up negative energies here and there if you're not careful. So right. that's just the reality of the situation. All right. And why do you think so many people label it a good and a bad energy? Or, a, you know, um, why is there such a fear surrounding what this maybe some people call dark energy? Why, why is that there? Well, I think, number one, we, we fear the unknown. So it is very frightening to think that some sort of uh, alien force outside of you has the ability to manipulate you, to attach to you without your control. But in essence, we do have control. We have control through the spiritual power of prayer. We have protections that we can do through invoking the Holy Spirit or the Christ consciousness. So we have the ability to keep ourselves clear and balanced. But if we don't understand that or learn those techniques, then we are uh, susceptible to what I call those nasty spiritual viruses out there. And right. you've got to remember there's two energies in the universe. There's love and fear. And we have the ability to choose which master to serve. So right. if you keep yourself in the vibrations of love, you're going to keep yourself in that vibration even when you're dealing with the supernatural. Right. And you talked a little bit about energy anatomy, which... Uh, could be a new topic for some people. Can you tell us a little bit about energy anatomy and kind of how it relates to the spiritual realms and possession in particular? Yeah, now see, this is a fascinating subject that hasn't really been talked about, and this was something that I have found through my research and through the exorcisms that I've performed over the years. We all have a physical body, and we all have a spiritual body. And, of course, the spiritual body is made up of seven vortexes that align vertically up and down the spinal column. And those energy centers pretty much run the show emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Okay? So when a possession happens, it depends on what the type of spirit it is. If it's a spirit attachment, let's say that it's a, uh, a lost soul, a ghost that hasn't crossed over, and they decide to hang around us. Well, they can attach to the outside of our energy field, and that usually happens at the uh, top of the head or the shoulders. So when I'm looking at someone and they've got attachments to them, human souls that haven't crossed over, that have decided to attach to them, they're hanging around the upper part of the auric system because the chakra system, as it vibrates, creates the aura that surrounds the body, the living energy that surrounds our body. Right. And so um, if you're dealing with something a lot heavier, demonic spirits, demonic spirits are a little bit more nastier. And they will begin to possess a person through the root chakra, which is what we all sit on. It's the root chakra at the base of the spine. Because they want to interfere and they want to come in through the bottom and then seep up through the entire spiritual anatomy. And I go to, into explanations about that in the book. But that's how I see and work with people, and I can kind of tell what's got a hold of them depending on where the energies are as far as the attachments go for the... Uh, chakra system. And I haven't really seen that. I, it was something that was natural to me and what I could actually see through my psychic eyes working with people. So 
it was a way to discern the type of spirits that were trying to interfere with somebody if they were having a problem like that. But it's a pretty fascinating right. subject, and I was really glad to write about that this time. Yeah, I love that. It was something new that uh, you heard of like – I'd come across energy medicine and energy healing, but to hear the energy anatomy and especially how it connected to you know, possession and things like that was really fascinating. Um, you also talked about the nature realm, which to me is something very near and yeah. dear to my heart. Um, many people might not be familiar with the nature realm and the deities involved. Um, can you talk about the role fairies and divas play in the, in the big picture when talking about the nature realm? Well, yeah. It, it, the, the nature realm is an incredible supernatural realm. And it's interesting because there aren't as many humans as we like to think that have access to the nature realm. The nature realm is extremely protective of its source. Right. So what we call fairies would be considered the guardian angels of the nature realm, and the devas would be the archangels of the nature realm. And they all have their place and their part in keeping the ecosystem moving with balance. And... Contrary to popular belief, these fairies, these sort of guardian angels of nature, don't really like a bunch of humans coming in and trampling all over their uh, ecosystem. So if you have really zero respect for the nature realm or anything like that as far as the environment, those little fairies can end up being really nasty if they want because they do defend their realm. So when you're connecting to the nature realm, you must connect with a sense of respect and a sense of dedication to the preservation of this planet. That's how you connect to it. And that's what their job is. Every plant, every leaf, every tree has their own guardian angel associated with it. And the archangels of that realm, the devas, they sort of run the uh, workings, you might say, uh, right. of the nature realm. So it's, an, it's a beautiful aspect to the supernatural, but it is one where you must have great respect. You should have respect for all the supernatural realms, but the nature realm especially. Right. Right. And how would would you give anybody um, maybe some practical advice for how to get more in touch with the nature realms? When, When you go into nature, when you are connecting to nature, when you're hiking, when you're having a picnic, anything like that, remember who is within that realm. That's really all you have to do. Just have a sense of respect for the unseen spirits that are taking care of wherever you're at as far as the beach or the mountains or the the woods, whatever. Always remember who is working behind the curtain. Right. And a lot of people want to connect. There's a lot of new age, you know, blah, 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 about connecting with fairies and all these things like that. But... The, real, the true thing is, fairies aren't really interested in, in connecting with humans. They have a job to do. So if you are one of those lucky individuals that happen to sort of fall through the wormhole and you end up seeing something like these lights in the woods or these beings and that type of thing, like some of the stories I talked about, just have a sense of respect. You've made a connection. You were blessed to actually see behind the curtain but I really wouldn't pursue it because, again, the nature realm is extremely well organized, and they really don't need us to police it except to have the respect and the need to also preserve the planet. Right. And in keeping on that preserving the planet theme, do you think that we have a problem connecting with the nature realm just because of the lifestyles that we live, or do you think that creates kind of a disconnection oh, absolutely. that you know, thickens the veil Oh, a absolutely. Bit? Oh, yeah, that that veil has become, even though the veil is thinning and we're beginning to see many different realms within the supernatural, our ancestors were more connected to the earth realm and had a better relationship with the nature spirits than we do now. So if we begin to have a sense of respect, respect and preservation, we can rebuild that relationship with the nature realm once again. But it's going to take some time because we have hurt them, we have betrayed them, we have scarred them. Right. So we have to prove ourselves. That's yeah, where we're at at this point. Right. And what have you found in your personal life and through your experience with the supernatural realm has, has kind of brought you back into connection with, with the nature uh, spiritual realm? 
Well, you know, it, I've always loved nature. I grew up in the Ozarks of Arkansas, so it was in my blood to just absolutely be connected to the forest and the trees and everything about that. So I was lucky enough to be raised in that environment, but for those that aren't, take some time. Get out of your concrete jungles and go into a real one, you know? Right. Get right. some time to, to, and I'm not talking about going to your local aquarium or your park. If that's all you got, that's great. You, you know, do that. But take some time to realize that there is living energy beyond just the concrete jungles of this of this world. Right. So that's the, that's the key. Just take some time to be out in nature, whatever that may be. Do it, and also get out there and get dirty. A lot of people don't do that anymore. Right. That's you know, true, yeah. They're all afraid of getting dirty or, you know, get out and play in the creek. Go out and, you know, learn to grow a garden. Even if you're living in the city, go out and buy some seeds. You know, grow your inside garden, something. Right. To get you right. to be connected once again with that cycle uh, of uh, nature. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what it was. If you, if a lot of people can think back to their childhood and you can feel that there was a stronger connection as a child to the, the nature realms. You have kids who have imaginary friends or talk to the fairies. I think sure. it's important to, to rekindle that, you know? Oh, yeah, because as a child, we don't have that sense of disrespect for, right. uh, for the earth. We're taught that. We're taught to not really care about what happens to our environment, or we're taught with just, hey, just throw that can out the window as you're driving down the road. As, as right. children, we don't know that. Okay? Right. Absolutely. Darren, we're going to go ahead and take a, a short break, but we'll be right back to Reflections, The Wisdom of Edgar Casey, with more from Darren Owens. And welcome back to Reflections, The Wisdom of Edgar Casey. Today on the show we have Darren Owens, and we're talking about his latest book, Mysteries of the Supernatural. Darren, in Chapter 4 of your latest book, um, you talk about some really controversial subjects. And the thing I love about you is you're, um, you're big into getting rid of the BS, because there is a lot of BS about there when it comes yeah. to these topics. Uh, the, in Chapter 4 in particular, I'd like, kind of like to touch on some of these topics and get your personal opinion if that's okay. Oh, sure. First, uh, you, you have discussed Bigfoot. So what can you tell me about Bigfoot? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I grew up, in, again, in Arkansas, and we have a really awesome folk legend here, uh, the Falk Monster in southern Arkansas. We have our own Bigfoot. So I grew up on stories about the Falk Monster, and I grew up with the amazing, fabulous, cheesy film called The Legend of Boggy Creek which was also right. filmed in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm sorry, say again? Oh, no, I was just, I was just oh, agreeing with you. Yeah. Okay. You're fine. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, years later, as, as I began to uh, do a lot of paranormal research and that type of thing, I and my friend did our own investigation into the Bigfoot monster in Falk, Arkansas. Because I wanted to know more about Bigfoot, and I really... You know, people weren't finding any evidence of this monster, really, and they still don't, right. not really. You know, there's no right. corpses, there's no evidence of any kind, usually, unless it's made up. You know, we've seen a lot of that nonsense going on lately. Right. But when I went down to Valka, Arkansas, we, we went deep into the woods, and I talked to the locals there, and basically it's like seeing a deer in the street. It's so common that it's not a big deal anymore in that part of Arkansas. Oh, wow. So they gave us the uh, pretty much where some of the recent sightings had happened at this point. So we just, we just went into the woods ourselves. I'm not afraid of any of that stuff. So right. we're trudging off into the woods and going deeper and deeper, and then suddenly we got into this aspect of the woods where there were no sounds, no crickets, no birds, nothing. And I thought, oh, crap, here we are. <laughs> and you could feel this energy. You could feel this very strong energy hovering in the air. And suddenly, and I began to get information, and it was as if the Sasquatch, which we call Bigfoot, 
was communicating with me. It's almost as if he knew I was sensitive to what was behind the veil. And I write about in detail when he told me what the Sasquatch really is. They're interdimensional beings. So therefore, that's why we don't see evidence of them. We don't find corpses of them, or we don't find anything physical because they have the ability to merge within the nature realms and then go in and out of dimensions. And they were here before we were ever thought of. They are that ancient on this planet. And so that's why in Arkansas, there would be 20 years go by, nobody would see the Falk monster, and then boom, it would show up again. Well, these are interdimensional beings. They go in and out of dimensions. Amazing spiritual beings. And the only way they can actually maintain their lifestyle is by sort of psychically putting out a very strong fear-based energy to keep people away. And if that doesn't work, they start throwing things. So therefore, we start seeing evidence of these creatures throwing rocks or sticks. So, again, I I, I write in detail about it, but they're interdimensional beings. So I find that fascinating. Yeah, wow. That's incredibly fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Um, The second topic was was Mothman. Can you discuss a little bit about what you found about Mothman? Well, Mothman was interesting because I had had my experience with, with the Sasquatch, being. And so I had already opened up my interest in other um, creatures that have been coined now as far as cryptozoology or something like that. So I was on my way to Maryland and I was traveling with a friend and we went through West Virginia and we passed this place called the Avalon Motor Lodge and we decided to stop somewhere else. And we turned on the television when we got to the hotel and it was the Mothman Prophecies, the movie Mm -hmm. based on this the incidences around this creature, found out we were actually in the area where all of this took place with the Mothman many, many years ago, the sightings and and all the occurrences. Right. And I thought that was a little interesting. And so the strange part about this story is that when I went into the bathroom in the hotel, it was as if, back in the old days, you remember the, the, uh, if a TV channel wasn't working, you'd get a lot of snowy effects. Yeah, of and course. a lot of interference like that. Well, that was the energy that started happening. The light started flickering. My head felt like it was on a channel that was kind of snowy, right. and the energy, yeah, was buzzing. And I felt like something was was sort of assessing me and kind of testing how far it could go with me, as far as its energy and its intelligence. And I ended up passing out in the bathroom. Oh wow! And so when I came, yeah, when I came to, I I had this clarity. I thought I think I just had an encounter with this Mothman creature. So I didn't physically see anything, but I felt it. And some of the research and some of the interviews I had done, uh, pre later after that incident, was the same thing. These loud sort of noises within the the inner ear and the sense of uh, a very strange vibration. So. I took that as my encounter with this Mothman energy because there were some synchronicities that had led up to that whole thing, which I talk about in detail in the book, which is kind of hard to do for the show here. But um, it, it, it's a strange interdimensional being, and we still don't know what this creature is yet. We don't right. even know if it is a creature. It could be some sort of interdimensional being, which is what I think it is, that seems to sort of be very scientific in its personality. It likes to assess and to engage with people, but for scientific reasons. It's nothing more than that. So there's right. really no connection to it either, not like the Sasquatch, which is very loving, right. very connective. This energy, very strange. I still am not quite sure what it is. I'm really glad I haven't had another encounter. Yeah, right. How fascinating. Thank you for sharing. And uh, last yeah. I want to just, touch again, on... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, think, I think there's a bit of a delay between well, you and I. Well, it just, again, proves that there are many beings within God's multidimensional universe that we still don't understand, which I think is the whole fascinating aspect of it. And I think the more psychic and open we are, the more experiences that we end up having over time. Right. Absolutely. And last, I wanted to touch on something that's probably very popular amongst listeners, 
and everyone out there and seems to be kind of gaining steam, especially with the media and you have things like Ancient Aliens, the show. Can you talk a little bit about UFOs and ETs and what you found in your book? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I covered it a little bit, but, you know, during the 90s, when I was working as a psychic and I kind of saw the ET and alien stick, I call it, as a religion. I mean, there were people that just literally ate this stuff up. And right. when I see that, I usually run the other way. Right. But I realize, and I've always said, yes, there's multidimensional beings, there's extraterrestrial beings, there's more than just us in this universe. But I, I think the problem is, is that we can get so attached to what is out there than what's happening in our own backyard. Right. So um, the subject of ETs and extraterrestrials, unfortunately, can become someone sort of cultish religion. I've seen a lot of people start focusing on connecting to extraterrestrials, and it becomes almost, again, like a religion. And we don't really know these extraterrestrials. So we again, just like we have discernment with the spirits, you got to have discernment with these kind of beings that you're trying to connect with. We don't know if these extraterrestrials are in league with, with higher consciousness or not. Right. So I, I really try to water down a little bit the ET stuff because it, it's like sometimes like angel stuff. People can get way too far off into that too. Right. right Pay attention absolutely. to your higher self. Focus inwardly. And then as we progress, we will see more truth about who these extraterrestrials are. But, yeah, that's, it's, I get sort of a red flag when it comes to the ET and UFO stuff. I think it can get yeah. way too far out there. Understandable. More of a shift of, of focus towards the inner journey rather than kind of the, the outer exploration. Um, right, right. You know, I, I talk about in the book going to a UFO conference and, you know, people are talking about having alien babies and that type of thing. Okay, now come on. You know, <laughs> let's bring it back into reality here. Right, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to shift to more of a, a personal focus here. Last time we had you on the show, we talked about how your life has been changed as, as a medium and kind of what your brand uh -huh. of mediumship means to you. Can you bring us up to date on what your life as a medium has meant for you lately and what's been going on with that? Well, you know, when we think of a medium, we, we naturally think of somebody standing up in front of a bunch of people getting messages from the dead. Right. And that is part of it. But in my world, mediumship is actually more of an enlightened perspective. It's not like a circus show, which is what I call those things. But right. it's the ability to walk between the supernatural realms. And mediumship for me works in the process of when I'm helping someone clear their house, when I'm doing house blessings or I'm releasing lost souls or I'm doing my uh, exorcism work. That's when I really come in contact with spirits is when I'm doing that work of healing because I look at exorcism as an agent for spiritual healing, which right. gives it a completely different viewpoint than the you know, the scary exorcist type thing. So right. mediumship really is the ability to communicate and to connect between the supernatural realms. And I think we need to get over the whole commercialized medium perspective like that, whatever that TV show is with that big blonde doing, talking about her big nails and talking to dead right. people. That's right. not really mediumship. We need to move away from that and get back to the aspect of mediumship as the enlightened perspective to communicate and to work with the spirits beyond this realm for healing purposes, not for show, right. not for tell. So, yeah, I have a big soapbox about that. <laughs> Understandable. So I hope that answers your know, question. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely does. And I know, I know you're, you're really um, digging deep into... Um, folk mediumship and folk healing and um, yeah. that that kind of area. So I'm sure I'm sure you've you've noticed more than most how how the media and how it uh, mediumship has been portrayed lately. But why do you think why is it so different now than what it used to be? Where if you go back to older times, maybe folk healing, it was such a ingrained part of the culture where it was embraced and practiced oh. within families. Um, what happened there? Where what caused that disconnect? Uh. Hollywood. 
Okay. Television, yeah. reality shows, they, they decided to monopolize on something that was so natural. If we look back at our ancestors, my great-grandfather, for instance, uh, would heal people using a scripture of the Bible. And it wasn't right. anything for him to be communicating with his mother that had passed on. But that was connecting with your ancestors. If you look at it that way, it completely gives a more legitimate and grounded perspective to mediumship. We are in right. connection with our ancestors. Our ancestors protect us. They guide us. And suddenly, in the television age, reality show age, it's like, hey, you know, let's, let's show what we can do. Let's see this person have these magic powers and get talk to the dead. So the disrespect has become apparent when it comes to something like mediumship. Nobody respects the dead when it comes right. to the reality show genre. Right. We are, we are literally looking at these spirits with flashing our lights and whatever those things they use, EMF readers, amateurs, but whatever they use to sort of shake at these spirits, like there's some sort of animal behind a cage. It's absolutely disheartening. So we right. have to get back to our roots and remember our ancestors and have more respect for the dead. Right. And then get beyond the whole Hollywood perspective of the reality shows and that type of thing. Right. Did that answer you, your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, you, you do, you talk a bit in your book about re properly respecting elders and properly respecting the dead. Um, what what yes. recommendations would you give to somebody who is who is dealing with kind of learning that relearning that um, rekindling that flame of of learning to respect elders and because it was such a huge part of our ancestral history. Well, the first thing to do is begin to do family research. Go back and 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 see who's in your ancestry. Right. See and and connect with your ancestors first, and then you can go forth and begin to have a better perspective on, on communicating with spirits and that type of thing. In reality, you'll find that people are always wanting to, to contact the dead and do all this. Okay, well, how about you talk to your great-grandfather? Right. You know, right. start with your family. Quit right. randomly throwing your net out there trying to find some random spirit to come in, because that's probably the biggest part of my uh, possession cases is these people that have zero clue what they're doing. They get out of Ouija board, and suddenly they got an attachment, and I had to get it off of them. Right. If you do it through a more legitimate focus of connecting with your ancestors, you have a better way of connecting and having respect for the dead. Even with graveyards, um, there's an old folk uh, process about going into a graveyard. You leave a few pennies at the gra gate of the graveyard as respect for the dead. Oh, and wow. It's a, it's a yeah, it's an exercise of, of respecting the dead and knowing that that graveyard is a vortex between here and there. Right. And I also talk in the book that there's a guardian at every graveyard. So if you have respect when you walk into a graveyard, you will be okay. But if you're disrespecting the dead and you walk into a graveyard, you could run into some supernatural problems. Right. Because the dead, the dead don't take nothing. The, the world right. beyond this world demands respect. We should have that. Absolutely. That's great. Great advice. Thank you so much. We're going to take a, yeah. another quick commercial break here, Darren, but we'll be right back to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey here with Darren Owens. And welcome back to Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Casey. We have on our show Darren Owens today, and we're talking about some mysteries of the supernatural. Darren, I want to talk a little bit about guides and spirit guides. It's um, something in my personal life that I've been working with a lot lately, and, and having a mentor help, help me through it has been a, a big help. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what spirit guides mean to you? Well, I think spirit guides come in many forms. Um, Again, we could have our ancestors being our guides, our protectors. Um, in some cultures and in some spiritual beliefs, you have animal totems that are your guides and spiritual uh, keepers. So spirit guides 
can cover an array of personalities when it comes to your spiritual um, connection. So, again, it just depends on what you are close to, what your spiritual beliefs are, and that's going to be your guide. That's going to be your spirit guide. Um, For me, I always feel like my great-grandfather is watching out for me and direct me and keeping me focused, keeping me on my path, that type of thing. So for me, he's, he's a spirit guide for me. And I also believe that signs and wonders still happen in this world. So, you know, when I see a certain bird, like one of my favorite birds is a raven. So if a raven shows up and, and connects with me during the day, I, I stop and I listen. I, I wait for a message, that type of thing. Right. So there's right. always spiritual guides coming in many forms. Yeah. And I, I like the raven thing that you touched on there because I've I found personally the animal guides have been a huge part of my life over the past few years. Um, is is, oh, yeah. is there really a significance to just keeping an eye out for, for certain animals? Because I've found it to be highly significant. Oh, absolutely. Because, again, the, the animal totems are very, very close to the grounding and the aspect of of who we are spiritually. They're an ancient energy. So again, they're connecting us to our roots, which is so important when it comes to your spiritual life. And people ask me, well, what's my animal totem? And I say, what's your favorite animal? Right. Well, okay, it's the bear. Then look at the bear. What are the qualities of the bear? What, What is it that you think of or feel when you think of the bear? Those are the same right. qualities that you have about yourself. That's what animal totems are. They're qualities that we have that we vibrate to. So if we connect with those archetypes, we can amplify those energies within ourselves. Right. That's great. And in Chapter 7 of your book, uh, you talk about the divine realm, which I, I find an, an incredibly fascinating topic. Can you tell us a little bit about your idea of angels and archangels? Because I think this, again, is another topic that really there's just a lot out there and everyone kind of has a difference of opinion yeah. about how how we're influenced by the divine realm how we can connect you know how the divine realm, realm kind of works right. through us well and i was i'm very simplified when it comes to the very esoteric knowledges like that so when god when when things are simple that means god's really at hand when things are complicated we've let god go that's how i look at it that's so when great. it comes to the divine realm we have many angels that run many things. So we have our guardian angels that are there for, you know, keeping us from being idiots and walking out to the middle of the street and getting hit, that type of thing. We have our healing angels, which guides the doctors and the healers and all the things that they do. Um, we have the protectorates, the, the angels that are our protectors that keep us safe and, and that type of thing. And then you have the archangels. Now, the archangels run the bigger show of the universe. For example, the Archangel Michael, he's constantly working with the balance of good and evil. That's exactly what his job is. He is the sword and the shield of God. So he basically is working with the balance of the universe and that type of thing. And what's fascinating in my work and and people over the years, you've seen people channeling the Archangel Michael, and I thought that was kind of fascinating. And I asked in meditation once, I said, so how can all these people channel you? And I got a very surprising answer, and the answer was, they're not channeling me. And I thought, well, how could that be? There are books written about it. So, <laughs> Right. <laughs> and this, I said, okay, so how are you talking to me? You know, this is, what's going on here? Who am I talking to? So the Archangel Michael says, you, I, I'm actually, I want you to think of it as sending you an email. Because if I actually channel through a human being, half the hemisphere of the Earth would explode. That's how (laughs) massive these archangels are. So Uh they send their legions to our aid. So when I'm doing work and I'm doing house blessings or I have a nasty spirit I'm dealing with, I call the Archangel Michael and his legions to help me in that matter. All the archangels have their legions that help us. Right. Isn't that interesting? That's so, super, yeah, I've never, that, I've never heard it put like that. Yeah. I love that. So when people are quote-unquote channeling the Archangel Michael or whatever they're calling it, whether they are or not doesn't matter, but the key is it's sort of a, a an energy transference they're actually tapping into. 
Because right. if, the, if the archangels actually entered our hemisphere, it would be it would be chaos. <laughs> Oh, that's a good, that's a good yeah. visual. I like the visual on that one. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know. And, and kind of in conjunction with angels and archangels, um, do you have anything to say about, like, ascended masters? I know people love to talk about different ascended masters, and, uh, you know, yeah. even whole books are written about what their purpose is and how to get in touch with them. Sure. And, you know, yeah. What's your opinion on that? I believe that the source has many facets to itself. Right. Now, personally, I'm Christian. My foundation is Christian, and my work is based in, in the mystical Christian teachings of Christ, and, and so that's where I come from. But the source will reflect itself in the religion that it needs to for somebody, to, for them to connect and for them to be enlightened on whatever scale they need to be. Right. So when I look at Ascended Masters and that type of thing, I see it as another facet of the Source. Right. Um, it may not be my my path, but it is a reflection for that individual. Right. For whatever they need at that point. I do believe that the Christ consciousness is the supreme ideal that we can all uh, tap into, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're um, Muslim, whatever it is, we can all attain and connect to, if we get beyond the religion, the Christ consciousness to filter everything through, and that becomes our ideal that we stand right. on. So that's my goal, is to help people realize that the mystical teachings of Jesus is for everyone. And it's not something that's just Christian. It's not something right. that just fits in a box. Because the work that I do is extremely intense, and calling on the name of Christ, which for me means calling on that energy, that consciousness to come in and help me in a situation, has always worked. It has always balanced the situation out. So there's some enlightenment there for everybody. But when it comes to Ascended Masters and that type of thing, it's reflections of the Source, the many flavors right. of God. I like that. Well put. I know yeah. since you, we've, we've talked about you really touch on a, a number of subjects in this book. Is there any subject in particular that you're most excited to get feedback from your readers on? Well, you know, this is the funniest thing, but it's the most simplest thing. The word occult. Oh, okay. okay. I have been yeah. dying to, to talk about the word occult because where I come from in the Deep South, the word occult to some people, you might as well be worshiping the devil. Right. Absolutely. And in actuality, yeah, in actuality, the word occult means hidden wisdom. And my life has always been about the hidden teachings and the hidden wisdom of spirituality. Right. So I, I finally wrote, uh, I think, a chapter on the word occult and the aspect of occult spirituality, right. meaning Absolutely. the hidden aspects of our power, of our spirituality. So that's what I'm really kind of excited about, because there are still people that think the word occult is something satanic, and it's not. We think of the, we think of the teachings of Christ, and we think of the occult teachings of Christ. Well, what you're saying is the mystical teachings. You're getting to the root of its teachings, right. the hidden meanings, because we all know roots are hidden. We don't see the roots, but we know they're there. Right. So you're getting to the occult meaning of these teachings. So, I mean, that's a little silly and simple, but I'm really excited to kind of get that out there and, and, and have people see the word differently and realize what it really, truly is, hidden wisdom. Right. I agree, because that's, that's kind of the chapter I was referring to. It's, um, you, you titled chapter, Occult Tools of the Trade for Spiritual Empowerment, yeah. Ritual, and Psychic Protection. Um, you touch on some really great uh -huh. topics in that. Um, one of them is kind of what weakens your auric field and what strengthens. I was wondering if maybe you can give yeah. us like a you know a quick rundown of kind of what you hit on with what are what are the occult tools that you would recommend? Well, you know, easy peasy stuff would be like your thought processes. We all know that right. if you are like ants at a picnic every day, you're going to weaken your aura. If you have a nasty attitude, you're going to weaken your energy system. If you try to keep on the positive side, if you try to keep more of a, 
a positive perspective during the day, that's going to keep your energy up. That's going to that's going to ground you. You're going to be more stronger in your spiritual self-esteem. Um, your diet has a lot to do with it. If you're eating a lot of crappy food, it also affects your spiritual energy. You don't have right. the physical strength anymore. You know, all those McDonald's burgers are really putting holes in your energy system. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a vegetarian, but I am saying eat healthy, eat living energy foods. That has a lot to do with it as well. If you're going to eat meat, eat free range, eat organic meats. Little things we can change about ourselves. Um, your spirituality, your spirituality should inspire you. If you're part of something that's disempowering you as far as a religion or something, move on from it. Find something that gives you inspiration during the day. Um, make sure that you're connecting to your spiritual source every day. We can get so caught up in waking up and our feet hit the floor and we go to work or we're doing this or we're doing that and we don't ever think about our spirituality. Right. Make sure you take a few minutes during the day to connect. That's the most important thing. Um, don't hang around nasty people. Don't hang around people that are complaining all the time. If, right. if some of your quote-unquote friends are just constantly gossiping or angry type people, move away from that. Find people that can inspire you and connect with you. That's the most important thing. Look at who you're hanging around. So you've got to find people that help to inspire you just like you would inspire them. So right. that would be a, some of the main things that would keep people uh, connecting with themselves. And another thing, too, and we can get really occult with this, too, is spiritual baths. One thing that's really important that I always tell people to do during the week is take a, a spiritual bath, which would be a nice tub of hot water, throw in some sea salt, and wash yourself from head to toe because salt, again, is a, is a protector and it's a spiritual cleanser. So we are cleansing ourselves from head to toe. We're cleansing out our aura, any kind of negative vibrations or debris in our system, anything like that, we're clearing out at least once a week. So therefore, you're keeping your energy clear, and you're also relaxing. Right. That's great. Good advice. Thank you so much. Yeah, and there's and a I, lot I, more, you know, techniques in the books that I tell people about. But offhand, those are some easy things that the listeners can do. Yeah, those are great. Thank you. And they'll have to check out the book and uh, get all of your suggestions. The, the book is, is incredible. As I'm going through it, I'm really enjoying it. Oh, thanks. Um, well, and last but not least, we'll, uh, you're going to be a featured presenter at the upcoming Virginia Beach Conference. Uh, it's later on this year. It's um, called Naturally Psychic, a practical course in awakening and developing your inner wisdom. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you expect from this conference and what the conference attendees can be expecting? Well, I, my particular part of this event is going to be teaching people uh, psychic protection techniques, using your psychic ability to... Uh, discern the spirits, learning how to bless your own home, learning how to keep up your psychic shield, that type of thing. So it's sort of like a defense against the dark arts class. Um, one thing I have found that's been missing in a lot of how-to psychic courses is really how people can use their psychic ability to use as far as spiritual defense and protection in their life. So that's, that's my part of this event, which I'm really excited to teach people about. I'll also be touching on how people can tell if they've got any problems with spirit attachments or that type of thing and how to clear their own energy from that. So it's going to be a nice little intensive. I'm excited about it. Awesome. Well, I encourage everybody to go pick up your latest book. It's, um, it's entitled Mysteries of the Supernatural, A Psychic's Guide Beyond the Veil. And it's going to be available through ARE. Um, have you gotten any feedback on it so far? Um, has anything I, I kind uh, of really, I, really excited you about it? Yeah. Well, uh, right now I think it's just now filtering into the warehouses and stuff. But um, right. so far, a lot of my readers already that have read my past books or that type of thing have been very excited about this book because they've been dogging me for years to write it. So right. I, I find that it's, it's really going to be popular just because it's a different take on a very popular subject. Right, right. So 
I mean, yeah. And it's my favorite. It's my favorite out of all the books that I've written so far. I'm very, very yeah. happy with it. Excellent. Well, Darren, I can't thank you enough yeah. for continuing to author these books and continuing to be available to everyone as just being you and being a medium and bringing your you know, particular flavor and your particular brand of understanding and wisdom. It's, it's truly refreshing. I, I enjoy having you on the show and I enjoy getting to chat with you. It's, it's been an honor. Thank you. Oh, well, it, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. You can pick up Darren Owen's latest book, Mysteries of the Supernatural, A Psychic's Guide Beyond the Veil. It's published by ARE Press and you can pick that up on the ARE website. You can also find his previous book, Becoming Masters of Light, Co-Creating the New Age of Enlightenment, also published through ARE Press. You can find that on the ARE Catalog website as well. Darren is also a featured presenter at the upcoming ARE conference entitled Naturally Psychic, A Practical Course in Awakening and Developing Your Inner Wisdom. And this will be held on September 12th through the 14th later this year. On behalf of everyone here at the Association for Research and Enlightenment and our broadcasting partner, moretalk.tv, I'm your host, Britton Bickerstaff, reminding you to always make the world a better place simply because you have lived in it. Hope everyone has a great week. I'll see you next week. All right, now it's time for the thought for the day. And the thought for the day today will be read by Dr. Bill Austin. Thank you for joining us on the show today, Bill. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And if you can go ahead and read the thought for the day. All right. This comes from reading 5089-3. Knowing self first this, thou art body, mind, and soul, a three-dimensional individual in a three-dimensional consciousness. Hence, ye find the Godhead to a consciousness of an individual in the earth plane. There is three dimensions. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each are individual, and yet they are one. With the body consciousness, the body, the mind, and the soul, each have their attributes, each have their limitations, save the soul. Nothing may separate the soul from its source, save the will of the self. I particularly like that one. It talks of our oneness with our creator. And it also talks about the one who can separate us or keep us distance from our creator. And that's our own, I'll say, individual or egotistical will. I think as a, as a guiding point for me, I know which direction I'm leaning towards by how I feel, when I feel fulfilled inside, when I feel content, when I feel happy, when I feel at peace, I feel like I'm leaning in the right direction. When I'm not, I feel like I'm leaning in the wrong direction. I'm going more towards my own egotistical will versus the will of the creator. Right. That's great. Yeah, what this reading means to me is that I, I love the line that says each have their attributes and each have their limitations save the soul. And it's, it's right in line with what you were saying, whereas you, you can feel it when you have your body, mind, and spirit in line with you know, what you would call the creator or just an ideal, um, a driving force that really drives you to better yourself and kind of 